Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. <laughs> Someone asked me recently, why take the time and spend the time to do as much as you do in ministry? And I uh, kind of thought about it for a second. I said, because I'm selfish. And they said, w -w 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 what? I said, well, really, I'm selfish. I said, you know, you don't realize this, but I exercise a certain kind of logic that I call reverse neology. And they looked at me like, okay, <laughs> what's he trying to say here? I'm beginning to think, you know, the guy's wacko as it was, you know, now he's really gone out on a limb and throwing himself to the wind, you know, and who knows what he's going to say now. But seriously, I practice a reverse neology because the scripture teaches that if we give, it would be given unto us. That if we seek, you know, then we would find. But really, when we get something, we give it. If you want to get something from God, you have to give it first, and then you get it. I know it doesn't make much sense in ministry to you, but it does for me. And so I call it reverse neology because I'm really selfish. I want to be forgiven, so I forgive people. I want to have grace, so I give grace to people. I want to exercise all these things in my life, so I do them. Because that's kind of what God said, really, when he was talking about the reality of there being that life that he would give to us, that we would no longer live according to our own will and our own way, but that we would choose to live his will and his way. He kind of does a reverse tables. He kind of turns the tables on us. He says, if you give me your life, I'll give you mine. If you'll take up my cross, I'll give you up, take up yours. So we find if we take up the cross of Jesus, which everything's been accomplished by his cross, then it's so much easier for us to bear our burdens and to give them unto the Lord. So quite frankly, when I'm ministering, I'm really not ministering to you as much as I'm ministering to me. Because you see, in some ways, I wouldn't read devotions in some ways. I wouldn't be devoted in some ways. I wouldn't spend the time. I wouldn't make the time. I wouldn't even go out of my way to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved in some ways. Unless I was doing it to save someone else. Because I'm not really that selfish. I don't think of myself first. Although I did when I started. And I learned later in life that it didn't bring me any satisfaction when I was all about me and I couldn't see that it was all about him. The fact of the matter is, once you become mature as a Christian, you learn it's not about you. Quite frankly, God's taking care of you. He's already written your name in the book of life. You're sealed, signed, delivered. You're already equipped. God gave you his Holy Spirit. You've already been given the ability to learn the word, to apply the word, to teach the word, to have the word living in you and alive, you know that you have the spirit of God dwelling within you and he's working on you to change you. So everything's really been taken care of as far as you are concerned. But what about the other guy? What about, you know, Joe Blow down the street or, you know, Fred and Dead, you know, and Fred's not really, you know, anywhere near coming to conclusions about God. What about them? What about their logic and their reasoning. You know, they, they watch football games on Sunday. You know, they're all burdened about and consumed about their interest. You know, they're interested in politics. They're interested in the world. <coughs> they're interested in their job. They're interested in everything else that's interesting to them. Frankly, I don't find it very interesting. <laughs> but okay, you know, they're into that. So, Fred that's dead, you know, what's he going to do when his job is gone? Whoa. What's he going to do when his football season is over? Hmm. What's he going to do when the politics doesn't work the way he thinks it's going to work? Well, you know, what are all these interests that people do with their time going to accomplish once they're gone? For me, I think of it as a waste of time. Don't you? So I like to kind of... I'm selfish. You know, I don't like to waste my time. I like to use my time wisely. I'm very selfish in the sense that I like to invest and get back 
return on my investment. I want to make the most money, honey, that I can get out of my money. So I invest it in certain things that I know are going to give back to me a return on my investment. Like I said, I'm probably the most selfish, let me put it in a better way, I'm probably the most selfish bastard you ever met because I'm really doing reverse neology. It's not designed to be first about me, but second, I'll take it. <laughs> oh yeah, give me seconds. I'll take what you're throwing away, baby. <laughs> you want to get rid of that Donna dumpster? I'll take it because I'm a dumpster diver. But my spiritual realities of why I do these things are in fact, I need you to be messed up so that I can share the Word of God, so that I can relate to you as messed up, because I'm messed up. Now, because I'm messed up, I'm not going to get involved. You know, I'm not going to teach myself. Physician, heal thyself. Uh, I don't think so. I'm going to fix you and heal you and help you and hurt you and, you know, whatever, you know, do something for you that, you know, maybe you want, maybe you don't want. But really, what happens is I get what I give. So if I give something to you that, you know, you think, oh, wow, man, the guy is like really, you know, off loving me and caring about me. Uh-uh, -uh, man, I'm selfish. I'm caring about me. I'm about number uno. Numero uno, hey, we're talking about selfish. Yeah. I want to be fixed. So whatever it takes to fix me, whatever it takes to change me, whatever it takes to make me into God's image, I'll give to you. Because if I do, then I get it. Do you got it? Good. Because that's how God operates. <laughs> he kind of turns tables on you. You know, it's like, you really want to, you know, do this? You know, you really want to get it first? Well, guess what? I'll give it to you. You know, and you may not like it. You may see it, but you won't like it. You're not ready. No, 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 no. So, I don't know about you, but people ask me, you know, well, why do you do the things you do? And I said, well, because I want to get. I give so I can get. I practice reverse theology so that I can have it in a proper perspective in theology. I exercise my right to give away what I got so that God could give me today blessings and honor and glory and praise for that which I did, sacrificing myself, and then he blesses me with more than what I had before. So the giving away is the easy part. Clinging to it I don't know about you, but man, for me, that's the hard part. I'd rather give it away than to keep it today. So really, that's why I do what I do. Because I'm really kind of selfish. I'm really one selfish bastard, and I'm all about me. But I do practice because I know I'm selfish, and I know that really I'm exercising, you know, a selfish attitude. I practice a kind of religion that maybe you don't understand, that maybe you'll get, and maybe you'll do the same. And we call it reverse neology. Being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. You cannot serve God and mammon. When you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Think about that. So when I'm investing in my fantasy football league, when I'm investing in my time in baseball, football, soccer, you know, soccer moms, you know, they're investing their time too. When I'm practicing all my, you know, like bodybuilding and, you know, getting myself physically fit, you know, and getting myself, you know, practicing my, Temple of the Holy Spirit, looking pretty shiny today, aren't I? Hmm. Better shave, better clean up, better be metro, better get the latest suit, better get the newest shirt, better get something new to do, because i got to have a to-do for those who know to look on the outside. After all, I'm not working much on the inside. I'm doing my spiritual things on Sunday. But frankly, every day, what is it that people see or don't see, but God sees and you and me know? You're one selfish bastard. Yeah. You take all the time in the bathroom, you know, and then you don't flush the toilet. Let's be real. I mean, I've seen a lot of pastors do that. Most recently, I've been shocked at one of the pastors. It was like, really? Wow. I was thinking about some other pastors I know that were janitors first, you know, that clean toilets. 
At least they cleaned toilets before they became pastors. Matter of fact, I used to go and help some of those guys that, you know, were official because I was volunteer. And we would clean toilets, and we would set up chairs, and we would do things, you know, when no one was looking, and no one was around, and no one knew those things that we did, because we would do them rather not to be seen of men, but to be rewarded by our Father in Heaven. So it was kind of a reverse, again, neology. It wasn't to be seen, but we knew we were being seen. It wasn't to be noticed, but we knew that God saw. So. I was fascinated when I found this kind of like, you know, well, you know, when nobody's looking, what are you like? And it's pretty obvious because I am looking and I can see what you're like. Wow, ick, ew, you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but, you know, when I look at a pastor, I think I'd rather talk to his wife. Because sometimes they're more about real than the pastor is. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe it's true. Maybe... My wife is more real than I am, because I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I don't really want to get contaminated by you. Ooh, you know, I don't want to deal with you. Talk to my wife. She likes talking. Or, reverse neology gives you an opportunity to be blessed because you choose the better way to practice and to preach and to teach and to live the way you say you do. Because oftentimes, that's the problem with the idea as opposed to the reality. The idea is up here, the reality is right here, and there is no way that person is ever going to get to what they just said. And I see it all the time. That's why I would rather admit I'm a sinner and bring my idea back down to reality and just say, hey, this is what I am, this is where I'm at, and this is the way we're going. So it's easier for me to point to that reality than it is for me to sit here and say, hey, I'm righteous, man. I'm holy. I flush the toilet every time I put the lid down. Maybe. You can't see it. Or can you? You see, God does say certain things that will make itself manifest in life gradually as you learn to be an older Christian. Wait. Watch and see. I do that a lot in ministries. I wait I watch, and I see. I wait till the pastor's done talking, the elders are done moving, the church is over, and see what people do. See what people say. How do they live? What do they talk? Do they follow through? Do they say things and don't do? Do they actually live out what they talk about? I mean, you know, everybody can admit they're a sinner, so I like to admit, hey, I'm selfish. That way you know and you have no expectations of anything else. Even though I practice reverse biology to be unselfish, I am selfish. I am a sinner. I am saved by grace, but that was free, you know, so I got it and I used it and now I use it, you know, of course, like you. But God wants us to not be like those that are caught up into wasting time, wasting energy, wasting and getting nothing back from what they're doing, you know. Let's go have lunch and talk about the kids. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> wow, I'm sure we're going to build some bridges there. Or let's go, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw a special occasion when they come up to see my church. After all, that's for why we're doing it, you know. Since they're coming up, let's throw a special party. Never mind the local people. Sorry. Next time. I think we ought to examine our hearts to find out why we're really doing it. Because it's obvious by what we're doing, why we're doing it. And when I see people doing that, I go, Ew, he's just like me. Selfish. You know, you see people come into town. You want to put on your best suit. You want to clean up your act. You want to clean the house. You want to spank the kids or, you know, discipline them or keep them safe or whatever. You know, you can't be real about it. Because if you did, then people would see how you really are about it. Selfish, sinner, unloving, ungrateful. Matter of fact, abusing the privilege that God is using. Oftentimes, that's what the sad part is. People that are older, they just kind of go, You going to do that? And you go, Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Do what, huh? Volunteer if I'm really 
stupid enough to jump into that pit with you, but I don't think so. I think I'm going to watch and see how you do this. I think I'm going to take a gander and see. You know, I understand you're building a house, you know, and I kind of got the idea that you want people to build it for you, but I kind of want to watch what you do, you know. I want to see how you do. I want to see what you do, when you do it, how you do it, and if you do it with the Lord. Because that's really wisdom personified. Because if you see someone who's spending time with the Lord, they don't sound so stupid, do they? They usually make sense. They usually can share with you some kind of experience of life and say, this is what I did and I blew it. I mean, I was like, really, you know, like, I thought I knew what I was doing, but, you know, it was pretty true because I stomped on people's feelings. I ran over their hearts. You know, I made mincemeat of what they were trying to give to me. You know, and I took their little, you know, offerings that when they were coming to me, you know, and volunteering, I just said, ew, and wouldn't do it and took someone else's instead. And I hurt them. And I hindered their walk. And I caused them to stumble. And they would have fallen had God not saved them. Because after all, it is the Lord's church, not mine. When you are in ministry, be very careful what you do. Be more than obvious about who you are, a sinner. Be more than humble about the reality that, hey, you blow it a lot. And you just blew it recently. And you just blew it, frankly, with me. Because... If you're out there thinking, oh, I'm not like him, you blew it. If you think you're not some kind of bastard or some kind of like, you know, female version of, you know, what a bastard is, then I got news for you. Try some time of the month where you're thinking that you're not being so bad about it and people are putting up with it. Or think about this time, the last time that you really blew it on your kids or you blew it on your husband or you blew it with your neighbor or your friend or your relative. Because you see, we're all sinners saved by grace. We all blow the balloon up and make ourselves puffed up bigger than we think we are. But God wants us to understand something about that, which is okay. God wants us to know something today which will help us along the way. God wants us to realize he sees us. Not only does he reveal our heart of how bad we are, but he sees us about what he's making us to become. His righteousness. Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believeth. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. O Lord our God, other lords besides thee have had dominion over us. But by you only will we make mention of your name. I will run the way of your commandments when you shall enlarge my heart. Being made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. You cannot serve God. And mammon. In Christianity today, we have a very serious issue that's popped up in the church. And it's pretty common, you know, it's theology. It's the idea that if you serve the pastor, or you serve the church, or you serve in the ministry, or you somehow put a Christian stamp seal of approval on it, you're serving God. You're not. Frankly, if you didn't pray about it, you're not going to get anything good about it. It's going to become ashes in your mouth. It's going to become dust in your hands. It's going to rust. It's going to become profitless. Because except the Lord build the house, the labor laboreth in vain. Except that Jesus direct you today, what you're doing today profits you nothing. You're wasting time. We're told that we live in the latter days, so we should redeem the time and we should be sober-minded thinking about those things that are of good report. Those things that are profitable. Those things that will make for that realization of someone knowing Jesus. 
of saving souls literally from hell, even despising the flesh that they're in, but saving the spirit so that God could take them home to be with him. That's the reality of why we have devotions and why I say reverse meology. Because it's not about me, but it is about him. And it is about salvation. So whatever you're doing that causes other people to be less than brought to Jesus, maybe you should quit doing it. If you're entertaining people rather than giving people Jesus, what are you doing? If you're helping people without praying first and asking God what he would have you to do, are you really helping or are you hindering? Have you considered the very simple fact that Jesus is alive? God is not dead. That God is speaking to you today and he wants to direct you in the way that you're going. But if you don't let him direct you, you'll go through the motion, but there's no devotion to God in it. So it profits you nothing and it helps everyone around you absolutely nil. Because salt that, la that has lost its savor is good for nothing but to be trodden underfoot of man. And your salt only comes from knowing the will of God in your life. Your salt only comes from hearing God speaking to you. Your salt is knowing Jesus and being with Jesus before you start anything, do anything, or attempt anything. Especially if you do it, quote unquote, in the name of the Lord. <laughs> You'd be better off admitting you're a bastard like me than trying to pretend that you're something more than what we all can see. A phony. A phony. Oh, we're not going to call you on the carpet on it. That's not our ministry. We're not going to tell you that you're absolutely the worst possible whatever you are. And that could be anything from a pastor, a teacher, an elder, a worship leader, a deacon, a simple pew sitter, a follower of Jesus, anyone that even says anything at all in this world, can I give you a hint, is a phony. They're all lying. Because all men are liars and the truth is not in them. At least when the psalmist said that, he was looking at the world and said, you know, in my haste I said, all men are liars, the truth is not in them. Except for there is truth out there in Jesus. Because the reality of who we are is sinners. But the reality of what God wants to make us and help us to become are saints. And a saint knows whom he serves. He knows that he serves God or he's serving man. And today I need to ask you, some of you, especially those that serve in the ministry, are you serving man? Are you serving God? And the only way you know the difference is whether or not you prayed today and God told you to go that way. Did Jesus tell you to do this today? Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, it's just provocation. But it also means something more than that. Have you gotten so hardened of heart you don't hear his voice? Or have you never heard God speak to you? He wants to. Stop what you're doing. Put aside your iPod, your iMacs, your whatever you got in front of your eyes. Close your eyes, ask God to lead, and then go from there. Just simply do that. Just say, God, I blew it. I lost it. I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing. Forgive me for going my own way. I want to go your way. Help me, lead me, guide me, provide for me today. Bingo. Go your way. God will show you if you're willing to admit you've been in control. God will speak to you if you're willing to admit you've not been listening. God will show you and speak to you and direct you if you're willing to admit you've been doing it your own way and not his way. Because it's not about taking a principle out of the Bible and pretending that that's God's will. No. The fact is, Jesus said bluntly, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they will not follow the voice of another. I might see you. I might know you. I might walk beside you. But I might not walk with you. Because there may be things that I see you're doing that I know God hasn't told you to do. So today, May I ask you please pray for the sake of me, because I need you to minister to me as much as I minister to others so that I may be ministered to. Let's seek together to admit 
we have gone astray. We have each one gone his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So we can be forgiven. We can be less workers of iniquity, but more workers of righteousness, of doing the right thing, which is what righteousness means, doing the right thing, by only knowing one way to do it. Asking God to bless that which we're doing. No! Asking God what we should be doing. Except the Lord build a house. Are you doing it in Jesus or with Jesus? Because if you're doing it with him, then you've got his spirit in you. And his spirit is telling you what you should do. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You're calm. You know. God's watching. God hears. God's speaking. The question now is, are you listening?